Good morning, everyone. If you'll turn in your copy of God's Word to Galatians chapter 3, we're going to continue in our four-part series about the blessings that we have because of the abundant life Jesus brings us. We've looked recently through Galatians in our study and have learned that the law was given to be Israel's pedagogue. That's a picture of what the law does for Israel. The law helps Israel do what it's supposed to do so it can survive as a nation until it produces the Savior for the world. And just like in the ancient world, when the kids were, were, were out there in the world, just like they are in today's world, they can get themselves into trouble. They need some guidance. They need to be able to get to school on time, get their homework done. They need to do all the stuff they need to do so that they can grow up. And then once they've grown up, they'll be free of that, but they'll have learned the discipline of being able to uh, serve God. Well, the pedagogue was hired by a rich family to make sure the kids stayed in line and did what they needed to do. But Jesus, when he brought his perfect faithfulness to this world, the services of the pedagogue were no longer needed. Israel had done what Israel was meant to do, bring the scriptures and the Savior into the world, and now we don't need the law anymore, so Christ has set us free. Galatians 3, 26 through 29, shows us the blessings of life when we are set free from the law. First of all, there are four blessings covered one per verse for the rest of the chapter, and with these blessings come corresponding responsibilities, because to whom much is given, much is also required. And these blessings were, what we've seen so far, is our perfect liberty in Christ. We have perfect liberty. We will never be judged by a law. We are set free from the law to serve a new system of ethics in which everything is wrapped up in one word, love. Now, we apply that in all of our relationships, in all of our duties. We need to be doing what we do out of love. We're no longer under the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law still applies, and we need to be loving towards one another. So, along with the fact that we are set free not to be under a law anymore, we have a responsibility to lovingly serve one another. Sure, we could just serve ourselves and enjoy our life because we're free to do so. But how does that help? How does that fulfill the ethic of love? Because we're free, we have the responsibility to serve. We have the responsibility to invest in others, to lift them up, and to show that God loves them too. And he's going to use us to show that to others. Then we looked in verse 27 and last time, and we saw our perfect security in Christ. And I wanted you to think about security from the point of view of a foster child. Someone who, who is in an unsatisfactory home as a kid, and the state comes in and takes the kid out of the place where they, they, they have called home and they feel they belong, and put them in a stranger's home who can take care of them physically. But imagine the feeling of being uprooted from your home and put with strangers. Now, in my family, we have done foster care, and every one of those kids that we have, have helped wanted to go back home where they felt secure. And since we are in Christ, everyone who is baptized into Christ is put on Christ. And the, the, the idea of putting on the robe in the Bible is an idea of being, uh, having the status of being in the family. When Jesus undressed and wrapped a towel and stooped down and washed the disciples' feet, he took on the, the garb of a servant. And that seemed awful strange to the disciples because the Lord is the Lord and we should be serving him. Well, Jesus shows that in the kingdom, leadership is really servanthood. And so the, the, the robe of Jesus' righteousness is put on everyone who is baptized into Christ so that we have security 
as a son or a daughter in the kingdom rather than a servant. But because we have that perfect security, we have a responsibility. And that responsibility is to maintain a godly testimony. We don't want to be the, the bratty billionaire son who just lives the life the way he wants to, drugs and whatever else goes with that, and he can do it because he's the billionaire's son. We would rather see someone raised in a very wealthy home take on some responsibility for being a contributor into society. And since we have security in Christ, we have the freedom to live how we would, but how does that help? Not everything is good that a Christian might do, so we need to think, how can I project a godly testimony that God is actually in my heart trying to live through me? And that's our responsibility since we have security in Christ. We need to show the values that Jesus would show and feel that compassion and speak those good words and do the kind of works that would bring glory to God. Well, today we're going to look at our perfect equality in Christ. It's verse 28, Galatians 3, 28. Our perfect equality in Christ. And it, of course, carries with it a corresponding responsibility, which we'll look at in a minute. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you that we can consider together how equal we are in Christ and that there are no boxes to check. There, there's no, no requirement or, or qualification based on anything you've given us that would limit us, or, or it, there, should, there should be no discrimination within the church because we are all perfectly equal in Christ. We thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. All right, so the text reads, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one. In Christ Jesus. Just real brief. No Jew, no Greek. No slave, no free. No male, no female. These are categories that we box others into. When we want to appear superior to someone, we define them in a term that we think is other. It's true of the world in politics. Oh, you're a D or you're an R. And, and, you know, never the twain shall meet. And the, the sin nature produces this hostility and conflict. Wherever we go out there in the world, there's all these breakdowns of categories, and you need to belong to the in-group. And, and so people strive. They give billions of dollars of, of, in America anyway, people, billions of dollars to put themselves into a category they believe will give them some kind of happiness or success. The cosmetics industry, the fitness industry, uh, the, the car manufacturer industry, designer clothing, these things show a value system of, of selfishness. The consumer mentality, being able to, to just consider anything you want easily can be obtained when you go and pay money. And if you don't have money, you're one of those people that really aren't worthy of it. And so that is a, a, a wrong way to think, but that's how it is in the world. In the kingdom, there are no such boxes to check. You can't use anything like gender, social status, or ethnic background to say I'm better than or worse than anyone else. We're all one in Christ. We're going to look at that. It comes in two ways. Uh, first of all, our perfect equality in Christ, we're going to look at how the text answers the question, what does it mean that we are perfectly equal in Christ? And secondly, why does it matter? Why should the church be different than the world when it comes to these things? Why? Well, we'll get into that. So Galatians 3.28 Starts with the term, there is neither, right? The words there tell us that there's a list of things coming, none of which, none of which matter. 
Are you male? Are you female? Are you rich? Are you poor? Are you a Jew? Are you a Gentile? Are you black? Are you white? Are you Republican? Are you Democrat? None of that matters in the kingdom. And we shouldn't make it a point of concern. There are no boxes to check. Whoever you are, you are equal with everyone else in the kingdom. Think about that. Because it is so different than the way the world works. So the first one here, there is neither Jew nor Greek. This is both a a racial, ethnic barrier or division. The Jew and the Gentile or the Jew and the non-Jew. And at one time, the Jew did have a special place. The place of being God's people, God's nation. The responsibility of Abraham's community to deliver the scriptures and the Savior to the world. There is neither Jew nor Greek in the kingdom. In other words, Gentiles are included on the same footing as the Jews were in the Old Testament era. Acts 6.1 you see the tendency that we have with worldly worldly thinking that gets into the church sometimes. Things can intervene and make a, a segregation that doesn't belong. A complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews. This is before the Gentiles really uh, uh, came into the church. The Hellenistic Jews were the Jews that were raised out there in the world, in Greek culture. And they might have intermarried and and some of their children might have Gentile blood as well. And then this, this, on the part of the Hellenistic Jews, a complaint came against the native Hebrews. The native Hebrews were the Hebrews that grew up in Israel. And they felt that they were privileged. They felt that that birthright gave them status because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now, what what God did about this complaint is that he had the the apostles uh, uh, tell the church to appoint among them the various... uh, people within their community, men who were, who were wise and spiritual, godly, and present them to the apostles. The apostles would then lay their hands on them and commission them for service over ministries like the daily distribution of food. We call them deacons. The word deacon means table waiter. And so God did something within the structure of the church to address the problem so there would be unity within the church. We see in, is that right? Yeah, we see in Matthew uh, 1, verses 1 through 5. Now, this is a particularly important text from the standpoint of Matthew writing Jesus' biography to his Jewish peers, the Jews that thought for so long that they were in the privileged place because they were born that way. And so Matthew wrote the genealogy of Jesus this way. The genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. And right then, the Jews are saying, yeah, he belongs because he's in that line of descent from Abraham and David, so Jesus could be the king. But then it goes on a little bit later in the the genealogy. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. First of all, the shocking thing is a woman is included in the genealogy of Jesus. The second shocking thing is Rahab was a Canaanite. Rahab was the one who hid the spies and sent the the guards out the wrong way so that the spies of Israel would be protected. And she became a proselyte into Israel. So she was a Canaanite, a member of a so-called cursed race, becomes an ancestor of Jesus himself. And then they had Boaz, and Boaz was the father of Obed, their, their child, by Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess. So 
Matthew is telling the Jews, get out of your mindset. Jesus himself has Gentile ancestors. And there's three women mentioned in the very genealogy, and women didn't even have a legal status. It was kind of irrelevant in that day to think about a woman being in a genealogy, but Matthew, knowing his people and what they need to know about Jesus, gave in his genealogy of Jesus three women. The other one is Bathsheba, a Hittite. So, just want you to know that the Bible, right from the start of the very New Testament, is laying it down that we're all equal. There's no boxes to check. There's no reason to regard women or poor people or Gentiles or any ethnic group. There's no reason to consider them second-class Christians. There is neither. And we're looking at Jew and, Jew and Greek right now. Uh, in, in, verse, or in Ephesians 2, Paul wrote, this is, this is the main passage where he used to address the idea that in the church there's both Jew and Gentile as one. You, the Gentiles, the ones in Ephesus, remember that you were separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, to the covenants of promise. Having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. So that distinction of race, or that distinction of cultural differences and background is broken down. No longer is that wall meaningful at all. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law, so that in himself he might make the two, Jew and Gentile, racial and cultural people at odds with each other, into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. For through him we both, Jew and Gentile, have our access into one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So, clearly, you can be born black or white. You can be born with a, a, out of an Eastern culture or a Western culture. doesn't matter who your parents were. You didn't choose that, by the way. God did. So it's a God-given distinction. Are you black? Be proud of that. God made you that way because it's beautiful. Are you white? Be proud of that because God made you that way because it's beautiful. This is a godly category. God established all the nations and cultures of the world from one bloodline. And he did it for the facilitation of the gospel. We know what we learned that from uh, Acts chapter 17 a few weeks ago. Okay, so we've covered Jew and Greek. Let's move on. There is neither slave nor free man. Now, we're very, given America's history, we're very averse to the word slave because in our history, there was a very racist uh, system that valued white people over black people. And it enslaved black people in a wicked way. Now, that was a sin that was throughout the entire world since the dawn of time, since the dawn of nations. One people subjugate another, exerted their power over them, 
and dehumanize them. It's happened all throughout history. The, the unique thing about America and Great Britain, the Western culture, is that Christianity has been welcomed into the culture and the values of equality have actually corrected, at least in large part, have corrected the culture. So now we have somewhat of a colorblind society. Certainly there are still lingering effects and there are communities in our country which are underserved. What do you do about underserved communities? Gospel. You raise a community by giving it Christ and Christian values. You don't do it by creating more division and making it all a political thing that you, because you're not a part of this community now, need to be pushed down to make it more in equity. Equity and equality are not the same thing. Equality is what we are. We are equals. Equity is a way of saying that everyone should have the same outcome. But the fact of the matter is God gives different gifts to different people. And some people use Christian values to work hard and to achieve and be successful. And some people don't. And it doesn't matter what the skin color is. It matters what the heart is. And the, the way to, to lift a community out of uh, oppression is to set it free. Give it education. Give a community uh, uh, freedom to, to achieve. But the outcome can't be imposed if you impose an outcome, it's no longer equality because you're pushing someone down, taking their success and spending it over to the other community. And the problem with that is it dehumanizes. It's not the same as equality. Equity dehumanizes. Equality lifts. And so the, the way to attack a problem of lingering effects of, a, of America's ancient... Racism is to love the communities that are, are poor with the gospel. Give them an eternity of blessedness. If you, if you put it in terms of politics and say, oh, you have to even out society, all the people who worked hard and achieved, we got to we got to dehumanize them because they're the culprits. And then we can give it to some others who doesn't matter what they believe or if they haven't achieved or, or whatever. It's dehumanizing to do it that way. The gospel is the answer to change from the heart out. Politics are just Satan's way of imposing some type of division within a group to, to try and manipulate some result. And that goes on in politics all the time. That's the way the world works. There is neither slave nor free man. Now, back in those days, uh, it was pretty common to refer the term slave to a, an indentured servant. It wasn't the same thing as race-based slavery, which is a wicked system. It was more of an economic system that if you went into debt, you need to pay your debt. And until you pay your debt, you're going to work off your debt to this family. And so whether you are slave or free is talking about your social standing. Are you rich or poor? Are you a business owner or a employee? Are you wealthy or are you in poverty? And so, in the church, there should be no distinction. As a matter of fact, why does God give money to some people or put them, make them be born in a wealthy family where they get the education and work hard? Why does God bless some people that way and not others? 
God doesn't give the blessing to people because they deserve it. God gives the blessing to people so they will use it. I was just talking this morning about, I think it was Elon Musk, one of the billionaires in this world who is considering taking his billions and devoting it to a charity that feeds millions and millions of poverty-stricken people in this world. Well, God didn't give Elon Musk his billions so that Elon Musk could live higher than anybody else, but so that he could be able to give back to help others. That's why God gives blessings like that. And so we shouldn't elevate the rich as though they're in some way special and the poor uh, chew them out because they haven't achieved. It's really a distinction, rich and poor, that people use. But it's God who gives the blessings and it's for God that those blessings should be given back. Right? So look at this. Were you called while a slave? Don't worry about it. But if you, were, if you are able to become free, rather do that. Which means pay off your debt and get, it, get the job that will, will put food on your table and give you some extra so you can share with others. Oops, let me go back. If you can become free, Jesus wants to set you free. If you're owing somebody something, that doesn't mean you don't have to pay it back. We all have a responsibility. Now, the envy of money is really a problem. Envying the money uh, is dehumanizing. It causes you to look down upon the person who has worked hard to achieve or who was born into a family where there's been an uh, accumulation of wealth. But those people shouldn't be looked down on and neither should they be elevated. God is the one who puts you in a family that's rich or poor and, and you can raise your status by work and trust and applying God's principles in life. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. As a matter of fact, there are instances in the American system of slavery, which was wicked, where in the church, a slave could be a deacon with authority over his owner. That actually happened. In the church, it's different than in the world. We have deacons, we have pastors. These are, these are people in the church that, that have risen to some level of responsibility. But in the kingdom, authority is not a, is not a privilege. Authority is a responsibility to serve. Leadership is servanthood in the kingdom. Remember that context. Because we always lift up the leader and say, oh, wow, he's a dignitary. We're so impressed. But that dignitary has been given not privilege, but responsibility. It's the responsibility of the person who has risen to a level of authority to use his position to be good for, for the whole country. That's not what you see in the world. In the world, you see people uh, scrounging for more power and will twist the truth in order to get it and keep it. But that's not what their responsibility is. No, nope. their responsibility is to, is to protect and care for those in their charge. And so you should respect the, the bum who sleeps in the gutter as image of God as much as you should respect the, the multi-billionaire owner of companies, right? Because they're just human beings. They're equals in Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men, brethren. Each one is to remain with God in the condition in which he was called. So if you are a free person, if you're the owner of a company, 
if you if you are able to serve the Lord, don't give that blessing away. Use it for the Lord. James 2 says it this way. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes. And you say, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say to, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. If you do that, if you treat him differently, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Why would you honor the rich man in your church and push down the poor man in your church? Might it be because the rich man can give more? That's evil motives. Right? Listen, my beloved brethren. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? Which, which scale are you using? Right? The scale of money or the scale of faith, usefulness in the kingdom. And the heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him, but you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? So we tend to gravitate towards money and call that success and set up a, a division within the church. Boy, wouldn't it be great if we could get a few millionaires in here? Well, you know what? It would be also great if we could get a few poor people in here who need love and need our ministry. Right? But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. So people that are using their Christianity to get rich, thinking that, that's, that, that godliness is a payoff, they're hypocrites. They're, being, they're acting Christianly in order to elevate their business or whatever. Okay, That's, that's the idea. And, and godliness can only be considered a means of gain when it's accompanied by contentment, being satisfied with what you have and able, if you have a surplus, to spend it on helping others. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who, went, who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Money is not the answer. If you have it, God gave it to you so that you could share it. That's a voluntary choice you make. You're free not to. But what kind of a person would you be if you see your brother in need and you have the means to help and you turn off your heart of compassion from him? How could the love of God live in you? To whom much, uh, who have been given much, much is also required. So there is neither Jew nor Greek, that's racial equality, and there's no such thing as status based on wealth, slave or free man. Let's look at the next one, which is also pretty controversial. There is neither male nor female. There's neither male nor female. So there's no on your list of qualifications for a role within the church. 
There's no box to check that says male or female. That's what that text says. Genesis 1, 27, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created them at the same time. In the story of Genesis chapter 2, Adam's alone, and God then takes a rib out of him in some flesh and fashions the woman. Well, what that's saying is Eve was created with Adam, but Adam needed to feel alone, so when Eve was separated from his body, he would appreciate it. That's why God showed him the animals and saw the lion at a lioness, the stallion at a mare. Male, female. There was no partner suitable for Adam. And so he fashioned the most beautiful creature in the world of all time his perfect, beautiful wife. And he was so pleased as he had learned to appreciate her. So they were equals and partners. I know the word helper is given. That I will make a help suitable for him. That shouldn't be thought of as a, a, a lower status at all. Because helpers can actually have a higher status. What do I mean? If you're out there in a, in a river, drowning, trying to get your head above water and you cry for help, you're obviously not able to help yourself out of that predicament. If I'm standing on the shore and I have a ring, a life ring and a rope and I throw it to you and I pull you to shore, I've helped you. Are you going to consider me lower than you? Or are you going to be very thankful that I was able to help you. So Adam needed the help. It's not good for man to be alone. So he got his partner. Now when sin came into the world, it changed, unfortunately. It says to Eve, God said to Eve, because you have done this, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. The consequence of Eve's sin, both Adam and Eve had consequences for their sin, as did the serpent. But with Eve, the consequence was a rivalry within the relationship of your home. Your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Not that he's supposed to rule over you, but that now, because of his sin nature and his superior strength in general, He's going to impose that upon you. There's going to be a rivalry, a division within the home that never would have existed without sin. But because men are jerks after the fall, they're not going to be very appreciative of the equal partner that they have. So you hear in Scripture some, of, some verses where it seems that, that women are to be subservient to men. But remember, every text has a context. As a matter of fact, a text without a context is a proof text or a pretext for a proof text. So you have to be, read, read carefully. And I know you love Jesus more than tradition, and I know the tradition has been Keep women out of certain positions in the church. But I know, I know you love Jesus more. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees about a problem. The Pharisees uh, said, oh, we're, we're great obeyers of the, of the law. We're experts. And there's a temple tax or a temple need, need for money to be donated to the temple and if you, if you think your parents are a financial burden to you when they're in retirement, 
You can get out of that responsibility to honor your parents if you say, oh, I'm devoting it to temple ministry. So I'm excused. That way I get credited for being a good religious guy, and I don't have the burden of taking care of my parents. So Jesus says, for God said, and that's different than what the tradition said. The tradition said, give to the temple and you're off the hook with your parents. For God said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God, he is not to honor his father or his mother. And by this, you invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So tradition gives us a, a, a mindset that's really hard to get out of. And we, we've, we've stitched together some verses without context to say, Women have a particular place in the church. They have a box. If they check the box, they're not qualified for certain other positions in the church. That's tradition. That's not text. There's a few texts taken out of context that can maybe say that. But you got to look at the text. God gave us the text. That's what God said. God said, honor your mother and father. The tradition said, if I don't want to honor my mother, mother and father, I can give away their livelihood to the church or to the temple. And that is not a way to love God. Listen to what God says. So there's a couple verses. Uh, this one in Ephesians 18 through 21. Okay, so here's the one that says that the husband is the head of the wife and the wife needs to submit to the husband. Okay. Here's the context. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Now that sounds like unity and joy and fellowship. Always giving thanks for all the things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Everyone is to be submissive to everyone else. Now, the relationships that were mentioned were wives, respect your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Both are submission. Respect means you respect their position. Love means you elevate them in affection and you elevate them in value. So really it's the same thing, but why a different word for men, love, and a different word for women, respect? Well, because the ladies don't need to be challenged about love as much as the men. In general, women are better at relationships. And then why the women here respect and not the men? Well, it's because of that rivalry in the home that was mentioned in Genesis chapter 3. It's, it's easy for a woman to see her husband being bullish and lose respect for him. But God is calling on the woman to try and respect him anyway for the sake of the unity within the home, in a Christian home. And the picture of that is Christ loving the church self-sacrificially, elevating the church in value and affection that he would even die for the church, and the church being thankful for what the Lord has done. doesn't mean the husband deserves it. I don't know of any husband that can 
perfectly love his wife the way Christ perfectly loved the church, but that's the standard. And so the, the, the marriage is a picture of Christ's relationship to the church. The context is everyone submits in the church. It's not singling out the women. Okay, so there's another one. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says, and now the context here is, is Timothy is, is Paul's right-hand man in Ephesus. And he's got to appoint leaders for the church. And they lived in a time, in a day and age, where women in the society were considered second-class citizens. Okay? So in the society, it would have been hard and perhaps creating of conflict to put a woman over a man in authority. But Paul says, I do not allow women to teach and exercise authority over a man in the church. Okay, so what Paul does say, there's no box to check. There is no relevant distinction between men and women. You can't use their maleness or femaleness to say you're qualified and you're not. That's what he says in Galatians. But what he says here is, I do not allow it. So Paul, as the denominational leader, was helping his assistant, Timothy, to appoint people that were, in that time, good for leadership within the church. Because to put a woman in charge of the community in that day and age wouldn't have been as easily accepted as it is in this day and age when Christianity has elevated the status of women. Jesus showed his heart to elevate the status of women as soon as he was resurrected. He appointed a woman to be the witness to go testify that Jesus has risen. Women have no status in court. Their testimony is not to be received because they're less intelligent, so to speak, or they're uneducated, or they're dubious in their morals. So the male-dominated system of the day put the men in a position of running things and testifying in court. Jesus turned that upside down when he selected Mary Magdalene to be the first witness. So obviously, the world of the ancient times had slaves and it had distinctions of gender and so forth. Well, because Christianity has gone and, and Western culture has been somewhat more evened out between men and women and black and white, because, because of that, there's a lot more ability for people to accept leadership from a woman. So let's talk about why it matters. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. Those categories are meaningless in the church because we're all equals. Right? So our perfect equality is ethnic equality, social equality, and gender equality. Right? Why does it matter? For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus wants his church to reflect the way it's supposed to be from creation, where men and women are partners, equals in the church. Okay. Uh, listen to this in Luke 12. I'm going to go into this in some detail tonight. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. It's a cry for equity, not equality. Hey, it's not fair. My, my brother, the older, evidently, has a double portion, and he's not letting me have my single portion to go live my way. The family should be in unity. The family should pool its funds and be good for everybody. The one who has the double portion has a double responsibility. 
to think about how to use that for the good of the whole. But the other brother, who felt like it was unfair, wanted some equity. Not equality, equity. And what does Jesus say? Sounds reasonable. You know, well, yeah, you should give your brother his fair share. Why are you hogging it all? Right? Jesus says, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter over you? The word arbiter there is a divider, someone who who divides people. He wants to be a uniter. And then he goes on, he says to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. There's a greed that a rich man can have and says, I don't want them using my money. I'm saving it up for my retirement. So I'm not going to share it. Well, that's greed. That hurts the poor. But there's also a greed of the poor man who demands equity and says, well, I want my fair share. That guy's being a cheater. And, and, and so there's, there's some kind of outward pressure to even things out rather than from the heart, because you love your family, you share. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Life's not all about having luxury. Life is about having, being thankful for what God gave you and doing your best to maximize the blessing for others. James says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above. The wisdom of equity, making society, everybody the same in terms of wealth and status. That's not wisdom that comes down from God, from above. It is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. So, look at this frame from a few weeks ago. We see that the perfect liberty we have in Christ, which is verse 26, means that we should have loving service for one another. That's our responsibility. To whom much is given, a heavenly blessing, we have this earthly responsibility. Much is required. Perfect security means we should have a godly testimony, and our perfect equality means we should have Christian unity. In the church, we should have love and unity bind us together, Lord. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. There's a lot of Christians that are being duped by a false spirit of equity. That they're getting on a bandwagon to dehumanize part of the population in order to... Uh, artificially stimulate another part. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God, even the spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God, this is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming and now it is already in the world. Antichrist spirit is trying to make a one world system where a few people can be in charge, really only one person, eventually the Antichrist will be in charge of, and, and dominate the whole world. That's already been maneuvering in the halls of government for thousands of years. So think about that. Lord, you are so good and wise. And you've told us about the power of the gospel to be, uh, it, it, which is the power of salvation. 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Help us to not be ashamed of that. Help us to not get duped into a, a dehumanizing counterfeit for the gospel, which is the political arm to, to force uh, evening out society. But rather, let us love the underling and to help him to know you to receive your blessings. Help us, Lord, in the church to not have any concern about a person's skin color, their, their anatomy, or their bank accounts. Because we're all one in Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this week we've got a evening church tonight. Uh, ladies Bible stu study.